How's it going, everyone? Welcome to, let me check my audios, uh, episode 8 of the Carbide Office Hours live stream. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, let me know how things are going over on your end. And if audio, um, I know the camera is going to look like a potato quality because I'm using my primary webcam for a different setup, which I'll show you momentarily. Um, but let me know if everything's good on your end, and uh, we will get started momentarily. Uh, let's see, audio check, examples check. So, um, the topic for today is uh, speeds and feeds. Uh, that is a topic that a lot of um, beginners find daunting because there's a lot of numbers and figures, and let me show you what uh, you would expect to find if you were looking for speeds and feeds on the internet. Uh, let's see, episode 8 files. So, this is an example. Uh, let me bring it over to the main screen. An example of uh, end mill speeds and feeds from uh, Lakeshore Carbide, one of the, the vendors that I use quite a bit. And um, as you can see, it's a lot of numbers. And making sense of these numbers um, when you really don't know the terminology, the lingo, uh, can be a little overwhelming. So today we'll just break down uh, what are some of the important parameters that go into uh, good speeds and feeds and how do you apply that to your CNC to make sure that you have good quality cuts. So, um, I guess the first place to start is uh, what are some of the important parameters that you're looking for? Um, speeds and feeds encompasses like the, the technical um, quantification of uh, different aspects of machining, and one of the most important ones is surface speed. So you might see something like SFM over here. Uh, that stands for uh, well, it's surface feet per minute, which is kind of an imperial term. Um, surface speed in general is just the velocity of the cutting edge of the end mill. Uh, so how fast that, that cutting edge is whipping by as it slices into material, it can have a big effect on the quality of the cut edge, especially if you're cutting something like plastic, which will melt if you come into it too hot. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is um, inches per tooth which, again, a lot of people in America, they, they associate uh, imperial units with this, but this is chip load. So how deep into the material you're slicing uh, with each revolution of the cutter. And I'm going to switch to a really janky overhead uh, view that I've done before for illustrating speeds and feeds. Uh, so let me bring that up. And let's see, let me adjust my microphone so that I can actually talk and face my little overhead view. All right, so let's pretend that this is an end mill. Um, it's, it's not a fidget spinner. It is a two-dimensional representation of the cross-section of an end mill. And so let's then pretend that we have some some material that we need to cut, and that our cutter is marching through this material going from right to left. Hopefully that's not reversed. Um, so as the end mill is going through, it is shaving off material. And for each uh, revolution, it advances a certain amount. And uh, the amount of material that a cutter slices off for each revolution is the chip load. So that is one of the parameters that goes into speeds and feeds that um, characterizes uh, how the cut is being made, the forces going back into your machine, and uh, it's, it's one of the figures you'll see a lot that you're going to have to decipher uh, when trying to figure out uh, what feed rate to use for your machine. So Chip load is um, one of the things. Surface speed is the other, so that is the uh, velocity of that cutting edge as it's going through. So if you do the math, it's something like uh, it has to do with the circumference of the end mill because the uh, that radius is one of the things that goes into the circumference and also the RPM of the cutter. So these factors are what that chart that I showed you talks about. And so you've got to figure out how to uh, reverse engineer those numbers to come up with an appropriate RPM and an appropriate feed rate. Uh, so let's go back into uh, 
the computer screen and I will try and walk you through an example of how to decipher these things. So this is just one example of a speeds and feeds chart that you might encounter. Um, I will also note that um, if, let's say, for example, you purchase uh, an Amana tool set from us, Amana likes to provide a depth of cut and a feed rate. And those tend to be designed for more industrial machines. So you can't look at speeds and feeds as a, uh, a one size fits all or like a, a blanket declaration of, oh, this end mill only works at 60 inches per minute and a depth of cut of a quarter inch. There is a lot of flexibility in these values. And as you learn your way around them, you can sort of figure out what you can cheat and uh, which ones are more important to keep rigid. Uh, so um, le let me pull up an even more complicated speeds and feeds table as an example, and we will work backwards to figure out cutting parameters for, let's say, aluminum. Uh, so I'm going to open up some speeds and feeds from another tool manufacturer I use, Harvey Tool, and they give you a lot of data almost an overwhelming amount. Um, and so, as you can see, uh, SFM is one of the columns, and depending on the diameter of cutter you have, they break out different chip loads, um, which this is far more uh, thorough than most other manufacturers, uh, but it makes for a good case study. So if we want to machine aluminum, uh, we would look for an aluminum alloy similar to what we're using. Uh, normally it's six or 7,000 series, so we know we're in this row. Um, the surface feet per minute that they recommend is 1,000. Uh, so working backwards from that requirement, uh, 1,000 surface feet per minute. Um, if you're in Fusion 360 and you're making a toolpath, it's really easy to just figure it out. You just say what the diameter your tool is, what RPM you're running at, and it will just tell you what the surface speed works out to be. If you're using any other program or you don't have a calculator, there's a lot of calculators online. This is one of them that I've found uh, is fairly convenient because it breaks down all the formulas. Um, so I could say I have a quarter inch diameter tool with let's say one tooth and uh, you don't need to fill in all of these. If you just fill in the, the bare minimum, it'll actually work backwards and tell you, hey, if I, if I want to run at 10,000 RPM, which is the slowest that I can go, I would work out to a, sur a surface speed of 654 SFM, which is pretty comparable, pretty nice. Um, but if we want to hit the, um, the recommended SFM of 1,000, uh, let's see what kind of RPM that would require. Uh, so it's telling me about 15,000 RPM, which is great. Uh, I can reach that on my router. Uh, certain materials and certain tool diameters will not be able to hit the ideal SFM. And usually that's not too big a deal. If you come in a little too hot or you're going a little slower than what is optimal, you'll be okay. Uh, where it gets tricky is if you're trying to machine ferrous materials, which is really an edge case on a light desktop CNC machine. Um, but those, if you exceed the recommended SFMs, which are quite a bit lower, um, if I go down to carbon steel, we're talking 600, 200, 450. Um, that means uh, the speed of the end mill at 10,000 RPM is going to be a little, little too cooking for uh, what is ideal for carbide going into these materials. Um, so don't be freaked out if you can't nail SFM or chip load exactly. Uh, these are more ballpark guideline figures, but the closer we can get, the better. So uh, working backwards, I've determined I'll keep my spindle around setting between two and three for uh, 15,000 RPM and 1,000 SFM. And um, let's look at the chip load that they recommend for, let's say, a quarter inch end mill. So going back to the chart, scrolling over uh, from the wrought uh, uh, aluminum category, uh, a, a diameter of 0.25 inches 
means that we should be going for, if we're roughing, um, a trip load of 0 0.00275 inches. Um, so trip load again is how far the um, the cutter is advancing into the material as you're feeding it per revolution. So that uh, will dictate our feed rate. So um, going back into our little calculator, if we want a feed per tooth of let's just let's round down 0 0.002 uh, inches per tooth. Um, that would require a feed rate of 30 inches per minute. Uh, these values change depending on how many teeth your uh, cutter has because that changes how often new cutting edge engages the material. So a single flute would require a feed rate of 30 inches per minute, a two flute would require double that, and a three flute three times that. Um, so if you want to keep in the sort of the sweet spot of the cutter, uh, you have to work backwards from chip load and surface footage to figure out your RPM and your feed rate. Uh, let me know if there are any questions about that. I'm going to go take a look through the chat, see if there's anything I need to answer now. Um, so compression end mills and other tools that have sort of a depth requirement, because um, I don't have one here, uh, a compression end mill uh, only really starts to work uh, with the down cutting portion of the flutes after you plunge about uh, an eighth to a quarter of an inch deep um, and that transition point is a property of the tool those are you you would usually have to trade uh, depth of cut for speed um, there are some other other factors that go into this like uh, how strong your machine is and that's just something you're going to have to figure out. So um, let me see what's on my agenda. If you're going to, to have to take a deeper cut and you know you're, you're sort of pushing the limits of the machine. Remember, these are, are desktop machines. We can't take a cut like a, a Haas VMC. Um, a lot of times these speeds and feeds charts or the tool itself will define a certain depth of cut. So for example, in aluminum, um, Harvey would recommend a quarter of the tool diameter that you plunge in at, a uh, one quarter of um, one quarter inch would be a sixteenth of an inch, which is fairly aggressive um, for a shape oko if you're not prepared for it. So in these cases, or I'm sorry, that's radial depth of cut, uh, axial is three times diameter. So they're, they're saying you could do an adaptive tool path at a depth of cut of three quarters of an inch, which is kind of insane on a shape oko. So, um, in these cases, if you're going to sacrifice uh, anything for aluminum, you would want to sacrifice depth of cut. For something like wood and a compression end mill, you'd probably want to sacrifice speed. You might um, have a little rubbing, a little burning um, on the sidewalls, but that'll let you engage the, um, the downcutting portion of that compression end mill. Uh, so... Um, Let's say we've covered SFM, IPT. Um, I guess while we're on the topic of that uh, compression end mill digression, I also want to touch on some parts of end mill geometry. So let's go back to the, uh, the top down view. So if you imagine you have a fibrous material uh, like wood, I should use a different color. Um, let's say these are wood fibers going through the material. Uh, depending on how dense they are and how uh, tightly packed they are and how cohesive they are, as you cut through, um, you can have different effects of end mills depending on if you're uh, climb cutting or conventional cutting. <clears throat> so if the material is here, the end mill is here, um, and I am feeding through this way. Uh, that means I am scooping out material like that. I'm starting at a down here and I am scraping up material. In, in certain woods that can cause tear out of the wood fibers. Um, so you got to play with different uh, uh, other parameters in cutting uh, 
uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, I find that in plastics, uh, conventional finishing uh, actually works the best because uh, there's uh, two things that happen when you're climb cutting. So if you're feeding like this, as you excavate material, you're throwing it out behind the end mill. And if it's really hot um, and uh, almost melty, it's going to stick to the sidewall of the material back here. So you usually get like strands clinging to the plastic. And also, um, sometimes as you cut through towards the back end here, the, the chip sort of just uh, flips out and starts like just dangling out there and remains attached to the wall. So uh, conventional cutting ensures that A, you throw the chips out the front of the cut and that any sort of dangling chips are just going to be thrown off as you advance the cutter. Um, so the cutting direction can matter a lot depending on certain materials that you're using. And then, uh, what else? The, the end mill itself um, has some, some properties to play. So I will address um, end mill selection right about now because I think it's a good tangent to take. Uh, an end mill isn't just like a drill bit, like you've got one cutting edge and two, three, and that's, it just, it goes through it. There's a lot about the uh, geometry of that tool that makes a difference. So one of them is rake angle. And so that is the, uh, let's say this is tangent. That is this angle here of the cutter as it rotates, how it's scraping or shearing off the material. A plastic cutting end mill has a much more aggressive rake angle, so it comes to a much sharper point. Um, and the sharper it is, the easier it slices through the material, but it also makes it fragile. So you, for an aluminum cutter, you might have something a little less uh, steep, but still um, coming to a sharp point. And in a lot of the, the V-bits that you might see, uh, it's almost 90 degrees to that uh, normal line. Um, so those are some of the differences uh, in end mill geometry and why you really shouldn't take, like you might see a really nice single flute plastic cutting end mill. That doesn't work like a single flute cutter for aluminum um, because that cutter is probably going to chip the edge. But you can go the other way around, you just won't get nearly as nice a cut. Uh, so that's one of the, uh, the things to look out for and what differentiates different end mills specialized for different materials. Um, for tapered end mills, so um, let's, see, let's let's keep changing. No, yellow's not going to show. Uh, let's go black. So for a tapered end mill, or like a tapered ball nose, tapered square end mill, depending on where you are along that end mill, that RPM and well, the the RPM is the same. The surface footage is going to be different because there is um, the radius here is different. So that distance from the center point to the tip is going to be different, so as it spins, it's going to have a different velocity. Uh, usually, if you're using a tapered end mill like that, you're cutting with a small portion of it, or uh, you're in a material like wood, which it really doesn't matter. So um, you can find something in the middle, and honestly, when you're machining wood, like it, it's not going to matter. If you're a little slower down here, you're a little too fast here, as long as you're not burning the wood, and you're cutting it and leaving a fine edge, that's good enough. And what, regardless of what numbers you look at, at the end of the day, you're just looking for a good quality cut. And if you think of what you would do at a router table, you're not really like pushing through like a plank of wood against the router bit at like exactly the right feed rate. There's a lot of variance in how people uh, push material through a table saw, a router table. And at the end of the day, as long as you're not like scorching the wood and you have a result you're happy with, that's good enough. Um, for a tapered end mill in aluminum, let's say you're making a mold, uh, you just try and find sort of like the midpoint if you're only engaging for like the first half inch or something. Just find the average point, work from there. So like if it's maybe like uh, 1 32nd of an inch down here and a 16th of an inch up here, uh, just uh, calculate it for about a millimeter. Um, So that is a tapered end mill. Um, let's see, um, going through questions, putting in a new 
a tool parameter in Carbide Create from one of the charts. All right, um, so I guess assuming that we have um, speeds and feeds uh, picked out, we've worked backwards to figure out um, what uh, parameters we want to use. Um, we can open up our CAD CAM program of choice. Uh, in this case, we are going to look at Carbide Create and uh, let's make a fake cut. So we're going to cut out a rectangle. Um, go into the toolpath. We want to do a 2D contour around this. Um, now, the speeds and feeds that I calculated uh, for this example are meant for uh, sort of an adaptive toolpath. So it's not really applicable if I want to go back. I could see for slotting, which is the first row, I would want, well, I guess it's the same here. The axial depth of cup would be reduced. Um, so I would select the correct diameter end mill. Um, I can pull it from the aluminum uh, tool library. The 201 is our sort of general purpose uh, quarter inch end mill. There's also the specialized 203 for aluminum. It has uh, shorter flutes, so it's just a little more rigid. So I'll select that. Um, and then if you want to change your cutting parameters from default, you can do that here. Now you'll notice that the speeds and feeds that I have here are about, uh, at least in feed rate, it's about half of the recommended feed rate. And that's because, um, if anything, I'm willing to sacrifice that chip load in aluminum. Not really a, a huge deal as long as you keep it above one thou for tools that are... Um, smaller or larger than an eighth of an inch. Uh, below that, um, if you start looking at chip load recommendations, they get very small. Now we're talking like uh, uh, tenths of a thousandth of an inch um, as you go smaller and smaller. But for here, um, because the, we're using a general purpose router, uh, you really don't want to saturate the torque requirements of it and you also don't want to stress the machine because we don't have the rigidity of an industrial machining center so if you dive into aluminum too hard you're going to start uh, generating chatter or vibrations like that will leave a poor surface finish on your part um, so um, you would change the parameters based on what you calculate over here and if you really want to like if you're doing these things a lot uh, you can also program your own tool library, which I've shown previously, but I will... Let me try and do that again real quickly. Um, so in our tool library, you can take one of our libraries. You can duplicate it. Um, so we're going to duplicate an aluminum library for the Shape Oco, and I will call this something and save that, and then from here, I can edit different tools to change their uh, speeds and feeds. You can also open these up in Excel, if that's your jam. So if I go into Help, About, and then Open Data Directory, and I go into the Carbide Create folder, there is a Tools folder, and in there, there are custom tool libraries um, from the ones that you duplicated. So I can open this up in Excel, and then I can run whatever calculations I want, uh, come up with um, different feed rates and plunge rates and depths of cut, and program these all in. So when I go back into Carbide Create and I select a tool, uh, something closer to what you would have come up with on your own will be presented by default. Um, Let's see, anything else? Okay. Um, if you're doing this in Fusion, again, the uh, speeds and feeds, they, they're different fields. They will automatically update based on what you input. So if, for example, this is, uh, by the way, my testing setup for whenever I need to test a different end mill and material combination. So you're getting a little behind the scenes of that. If I say I want to do 15,000 RPM, um, it shows me that my surface speed has changed. Um, if I change my cutting feed rate, um, it will automatically update my feed per tooth. Um, 
<clears throat> so Fusion makes it a lot easier to match your parameters to what you would see in a chart. And that's just, uh, it, depending on how you want to keep track of your speeds and feeds, um, do you want to memorize chip load? Do you me want to memorize feed rates and RPMs? It, it's all up to you. And again, these are just guidelines. As you make your own cuts, you can fine tune them, figure out I can go deeper or shallower, or I need to take a lighter cut. Um, these are all, like, these are really guidelines. Um, using manufacturer charts, how do you adjust depth of cut and width of cut for the Nomad? Um, so let me, let me go back to the, uh, the old top-down view. So for me, the thing that's important um, is chip load, chip load and surface uh, speed, because those are two things that you can definitely match. Um, but what is difficult to match is the depth of cut. So oops, let's, let's do a fresh sheet of paper. Um, if I have material that I am cutting through, uh, that is wildly exaggerated. Um, I've got an end mill here. The, the amount of uh, engagement that I have is going to proportionally increase the torque requirements on my spindle and, and really tax the rigidity of a machine. So if you can keep the other parameters ideal, but just reduce your depth of cut, you can go a lot easier on your spindle. Um, and that's why a lot of my speeds and feeds that I've made um, in Carbide Create they start off very shallow. So we're talking depths of cut of at most like a 64th of an inch, um, at least for aluminum. And that's because um, that is the safest way to go. Uh, as long as the end mill is slicing cleanly through the material, you go as deep as you can without getting into that region where you start uh, like vibrating the frame or getting chatter and getting negative effects on the surfaces of what you're cutting. Um, so again, uh, Depth of cut is what I personally sacrifice first, but if you're using specialized end mills that require a certain depth of cut, you can go deeper. Or if you're doing something like an adaptive toolpath, um, you can often go uh, much deeper than that uh, because you're only engaging, um, let's go back to top down, um, a, a very shallow cut. So usually adaptive tool paths, you go deeper axially, but radially, you only go a little bit into the material and that controls the cutting forces and distributes the, uh, the cutting action along a larger pr uh, proportion of the flutes that you get on an end mill. Um, so those, that consideration is something that you have to just consider depending on whether or not you're doing a, a 2D contour or slotting operation or if you're doing something uh, a little higher end using adaptive tool paths. And the reason you can go deeper using an adaptive than a pocketing tool path is because of uh, corner engagement. Actually, I'm gonna go back to the top down view because I like that for explaining this. Um, so, let's go, uh, let's pretend that we are machining out a square pocket and our end mill is just chomping through, chomping through, chomping through, skimming off just a little bit each time. When you hit a corner or an edge, uh, and this is what a pocketing toolpath would do before it changes directions, is you would all of a sudden run into the corner. And suddenly you're hitting the material on a lot more of the radius which really jacks up the cutting forces that go back into the machine. That's why when you hit corners, you, you, you might hear the machine like chirp or, or squeak or, or just make a little rattling noise. That's because the loads on the machine just suddenly jumped up. Um, so when you're choosing your speeds and feeds, um, you have to uh, consider like the weakest link, um, the portions of that cut toolpath when you're encountering the worst resistance. And you have to scale everything back for the uh, the weakest link in that chain. Um, so pocketing toolpaths, I usually keep pretty similar to my 2D contouring toolpaths because you're gonna run into cases where the cutting forces jump up. Adaptive toolpaths keep a sort of a, a force limit that it will always stay below. 
So it's a lot safer to push harder with those toolpaths. Um, I see someone noticed my, uh, my professional engineering exam pencil. I am not a licensed PE, so uh, that's, that's kind of useless. Um, can't you adjust the toolpath to slow it down in the corners? With higher end software, you can. So in Fusion, if you're doing a pocketing toolpath where you can see the end mill would be going into a sharp corner before changing directions, there's something called feed optimization. So under the passes tab, if you scroll down, you check feed optimization. It will slow it down. Uh, in this case, let's say um, 0.025 inches or 0.025 inches before it hits the corner, slow down from my feed rate of 60 inches per minute to maybe 15 inches per minute. And you'll see that the toolpath goes into yellow in these corners. So that's, uh, if you simulate it, let's see, not there. I'll just click on one of these points and make the tool transparent. And I'll open up the info tabs. So it starts cutting and as it hits the corner, you can see the feed rate drops to 15 inches per minute. And so that's, that's one hack you can do to, oh, wrong camera. Uh, so, in if you, let me restart that, if in your 2D toolpath, fourth tab, passes, you go down to the bottom, there's a little field for feel, uh, feed optimization, select that, you can say, hey, uh, 0 0.025 inches before the corner, um, I want you to slow down to 15 inches per minute, and if you simulate that, um, toolpath, after position, so when the tool is coming into the cut, I'll open the stats. Right now it's cutting at 60 inches per minute. And as soon as it hits that corner or close to it, it drops down to 15 inches per minute. So that is one little hack you can do to make pocketing easier if you want to go to that advanced uh, next step in, in CAD CAM. Uh, but otherwise, it's really just pick the lowest common denominator, denominator in um, like your machining from a stress perspective and work from there. Uh, so let's see. Um, let's see, I have covered the safest option, which is to go shallower. Um, a lot of these speeds and feeds also. Um, so how I would scale something like this to a desktop machine is right off the bat, I would take the recommended axial depth of cut and just like cut it in half, cut it in like by a factor of four. Um, and for something like aluminum, I, I'd go even more. Plastic, you can be a little more generous about, um, but you have to assume that if these speeds and feeds are designed for a machine that costs an extra zero compared to what you're running, you should maybe uh, move the, the decimal point a little over. So instead of like three times the diameter depth of cut, maybe go like 0.3 times the diameter. Um, it's, it's just one of those things you'll have to get used to um, as you, you gain more experience. Um, can the Shape Ogo handle a 164th inch bit in HDPE without breaking it, or is it not precise enough? Um, so let's go back to the top down. Um, end mills uh, and run out are are two things that really don't go together. And if you have a router uh, that's uh, like a, even with our precision uh, collets, even like the best DeWalt, there's usually about one thou of run out. So the router is sort of moving in a off axis direction. It's gonna stress one side of the cutter more and sort of push it inwards. And so you just get a little bit of vibration going on. Really small end mills are really sensitive to that. They're just a lot more fragile. Uh, so for something like that, uh, like a 164th inch plastic, you might get away with it in aluminum and brass. I've tried, it really doesn't work. Um, and if in doubt, again, reduce the, the depth of cut. So you're, you're engaging less of the cutter and just reducing the stresses on it. Um, 164th of an inch is kind of an edge case. I personally wouldn't go below 0 0.02 inches or about half a millimeter. Um, so let's see. 
Um, how are we doing on time? So if uh, I've had this question on the forums, what, what happens if you buy a tool from a vendor and they don't provide speeds and feeds data? Um, in those cases, what I would recommend is uh, to just find speeds and feeds from a different vendor. Um, a lot of these general purpose tools that you're buying are, are very similar. So an eighth inch end mill that we sell versus what a different vendor might sell, they all basically do the same thing. So you can take the chip load recommendations, the SFM recommendations, and sort of just move them beyond. And for different tools, they're, they're usually very similar. Uh, so here we have, um, it, from Harvey, we, they would say in aluminum, use 1000 SFM. From Lakeshore, they say up to 950, 500 to, or sorry, 500 to 1100. Um, this just reflects how, how sort of, uh, how open to interpretation these values are. Um, so just find a similar animal from someone else and use that as a starting point. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, that's pretty close to everything I wanted to specifically address. So if you have any um, additional questions, um, drop them now in the comments. I'm going to go through some additional questions that I got um, and didn't address yet. Let's see. Um, extruded acrylic and if there is a triplet amount to avoid so the material doesn't melt. Um, so in most plastics, um, the chip load uh, that you are looking for is usually much higher than in uh, aluminum or some other hard material. So for plastics, what I usually aim for is at least um, three thousandths of an inch. Um, and that usually is a pretty good value for Let's go back to here. Um, let's actually, no, let's start a new page and talk about the mechanics of what happens when you cut. And keep in mind that I am no expert. So, material that we are cutting through. What happens when you cut plastic is as your cutter goes through it, as it's shearing through the material, um, it's that action of ripping apart those, uh, those polymers, it releases heat and it heat comes out from the cut and it starts softening the material around it. Same thing happens in aluminum, that's why the, the cut can get a little hot. Um, and so if you don't take a large enough bite out of the material every single time you go around, uh, you very quickly get to the point where you start getting molten plastic. And so taking a large enough chip load that you can sequester that heat mostly in the chip uh, before it saturates that chip, that's how you keep the plastic from melting. Um, so if you can't hit a certain depth of cut, at least make sure you keep that chip load up because that's your first line of defense against uh, plastic melting. Um, let's see. Special modifiers to manufacturer tables for odd types of end mills. Um, some vendors will provide uh, different... Uh, recommendations depending on the geometry. So for example, uh, this Lakeshore guide uh, has uh, your standard square end mill and a different set of uh, SFM suggestions for ball nose end mills. And that's again because the the diameter of that cutting edge varies um, along a ball nose end mill. Um, usually personally I would just pick an average if I have a quarter inch uh, diameter ball nose end mill. I'll just say, I'll pretend it's a eighth inch square end mill, uh, just because there is a good amount of room, um, a wiggle room that you can use. Just within these um, these range of recommended SFMs from this tool vendor, like it increases by a factor of three at the high end. So that is a, a huge variance um, that you can, you can program for. So I, I really wouldn't stress it. I would start with a test cut going just a lot shallower than you need to, but make sure your chip load and your SFM are good. You're not getting any plastic melting. And then once you have a good SFM, good feed rate, good RPM, 
then you can start bumping up depth of cut and seeing what works for you. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, let's see. Someone wants to know what an adaptive toolpath is. Um, so in uh, a program like Fusion 360, I think um, there are some other programs that have it too, I think Estelcam. Um, an adaptive toolpath is one where the, uh, the cutting forces are always constant. So in a 2D pocket, what happens as you machine is as you cut, the amount of material that a cutter is touching changes over time. It's not constant. So here you can see I'm engaging with almost the full frontal cross section of the end mill. And then in some portions, I'm only touching the material with a little bit of the end mill. And that changes those differences in how you're contacting the material changes the force that goes back into your CNC. And so as you go into these corners, um, you can get chatter, you can get vibration. Um, you'll see it in the part as just like wavy lines on the edge. And in aluminum and other uh, machining operations that are a little more high risk, I guess, um, these spikes in cutting force are really undesirable. Uh, so for this pocketing ex example, and that's why I do my tests with a uh, sort of a annular donut square shape pocket, is to force these periods where you're getting full tool engagement. Um, these are, uh, this is why a uh, Pocketing speeds and feeds are also applicable for the most part to contouring speeds and feeds and why I keep them pretty similar. An adaptive toolpath avoids this by um, sort of spiraling outward in a way that um, only engages like a certain affixed fraction of the end mill. So even in, let's say, these corners, um, it'll nibble away at the corners each time only diving into it that same fraction of uh, that cutter that you programmed it for. So it keeps, it, it puts a, a cap on the amount of force that your CNC is going to experience. Um, okay, let's see. Um, let me go through my, my list of additional questions. Does larger chip load mean faster speed? So. Uh, let's let's go back to the top down. Generally, yes. Um, depending for a, a fixed RPM, like let's say 10,000, if you want to bite into the material a certain amount each time, that means you have to feed. Your, your feed rate has to be proportional to your, your spindle speed. Uh, so if you want a bigger chip load, that usually means you have to crank up the feed rate. Um, if you can reduce your spindle speed even further, that means you don't need to feed as fast to keep up. And if you have fewer teeth per, um, on the cutter, that means for each revolution, you can feed half as far or a third as far or a quarter as far if you have a four flute. And that's what makes single flute end mills really good for aluminum, is that you can get a really high surface speed, but you don't need to feed like at 200 inches per minute to get a decent chip load because you only have one tooth to worry about. Um, and so that helps you reduce the torque requirements on your spindle, but still get good quality cuts because you're hitting that recommended SFM. Uh, let me see if there's anything else that I missed. Um, okay, uh, hello. I, I'm getting a report from the field. Um, Let's see. Any other last minute questions in the chat? Uh, hello, Jim from Ashland. Welcome to the Shapeoko family. And uh, let's see. For, for wood, it's really hard to find a technical answer for speeds and feeds because it's it varies a lot. Um, and let me actually, let me, let me pull up um, a video from earlier, please hold. Uh, in case you haven't seen it, we recently released a new type of side clamp um, that, um, here, I'll just pull it up on the screen while I am. So this 
is the Tiger Claw clamp. And uh, in case you haven't seen it, you should check out the Carbide 3D video um, that we just put out for it. Uh, but there is a specific shot in the sort of teaser trailer for that clamp that I want to pull up. Um, okay, let's go back to the, the computer screen. So in this particular cut, if this will ever load, um, nope, nope, right here. So I am racing through a two by four using a quarter inch end mill um, with a, a really large axial engagement and a small radial engagement. And the, the properties of wood change a lot as you're cutting through it. So um, I will probably post a sort of a B-roll unedited, unedited behind the scenes video about this um, in the next couple days. But as the cutter marches across the grain of the wood, um, the, the denser areas of that grain change the tone of the cut. So you can hear it uh, bogging down a little more further off to the left where the, the grain is a little denser and the, that sound changes towards the right side of the cut. So when you're dealing with speeds and feeds for wood, there, there's a, a large range of values you can use and that's why a lot of tool manufacturers, especially ones that are high-end industrial, they tailor their speeds and feeds for aluminum because that is what professional uh, milling machines run most of the time. It's, it's kind of analog. You have to do a little uh, trial and error to figure out what works the best for you in um, organic materials. Um, but again, start with something safe. Start with one of the recommended speeds and feeds that we have um, if you're not sure where to start. And as you get more experience, um, just feel free to crank up those speeds and feeds, increased depth of cut, increased feed rate, whatever it is, um, you will end up figuring out what works the best for you. Um, so back to the clamp. This is my, my little uh, five second spiel. Um, side clamps, uh, stainless steel body with a set screw. Uh, bolt these down to your table. They apply really strong lateral force um, to whatever it is you're cutting. Um, Check out the video. Uh, my boss did not say I'm obligated to to mention these, but I think they're pretty cool. Uh, so go check it out. Um, does Carbide Create add an M6 in the program when posting more than one tool? Uh, yes, it does. Um, M6 is the basically the universal tool change uh, G code command. So you'll see that in the uh, tool paths that get posted out of Carbide Create um, or Fusion or Vectric if you have the right post processor. Uh, for a little while they were like sort of non-standards compliant, but uh, we've got a version that does include the M6 program, so if you're using the bit setter, it will pause and prompt you for a tool change. Um, the Tiger Claw clamps are a little bit on the long side because a Nomad table is 8 by 8 so if you're cutting something smaller, uh, it'll work, but um, for most people, it might stick out a little bit, and that's why, for the most part, we're advertising these for CNC routers. But if you're cutting something small, and if you like a low-profile, convenient clamp, then they might work as well. Um, all right. I think that covers most of what I am seeing. Um, oh, last question. Does over-tightening the collet cause vibrations or run out? It really shouldn't. Um, so the way... A collet works. This is your spindle shaft. There is a ground taper inside of it, and your collet, um, this is sort of like the carbide Makita style collet, um, uh, usually there are slits in it, and so when you insert an end mill and you push down on this collet with the collet nut, it uh, forces the collet against the taper and in theory, the more you tighten it, the more aligned it'll be. So it shouldn't cause vibration, but at some point you are going to strip the threads on the collet nut and uh, set yourself up for a very expensive replacement. Um, can you plug the Carbide Compact Router into a speed controller to slow it down below the built-in speed control? So a lot of routers, um, 
Uh, there is something called like a uh, super PID or super PID, which you can sort of piggyback onto um, common routers from DeWalt Makita. I think it'll work with our own, but that is uh, not something we officially support. Um, but if you want to take that experiment upon yourself, you're more than welcome to try. Um, and yes, uh, a lot of motors have different torque curves, so if you run them below a certain point, um, they will <coughs> potentially stall. If you're using a speed controller um, uh, that will compensate for RPM, it'll detect a, a torque drop-off and it'll pump more current into the motor. But if you're running at a lower RPM, you don't have as much cooling on the spindle. That fan that's attached to the motor is going to be running slower as well, so you're not really cooling the motor and you're potentially pumping more current through the coils, so you can very easily overheat the motor, which is why a lot of routers say like, hey, don't run at like this low of a speed for extended periods of time. Um, let's see. Um, stock update for the Z Plus. We're working on it. We don't have a fixed date just because things are so fluid right now. Um, but again, if you sign up for the email, uh, as soon as they're in stock, you will get a notification. Um, or you can address it to Crystal at uh, sales at carbide3d.com and she'll try and give you the best answer we have at the moment that you send that email. Uh, can I go over the new vCar feature? We have a video all about that, which I can link to you, uh, or if Crystal, if you can pull that up real quick and drop it in the chat. Um, but I guess real basic gist and some already here is if you have a feature, you want to advance vCarve, Select that contour, advanced vCarve, pick a v-bit and a flat end mill. So let's say eighth inch 201, um, hit OK. It'll generate the uh, where the v-bit needs to go to pocket out the corners that the flat end mill can't reach, and then it'll pocket out everything else. Um, takes a couple seconds to calculate, uh, but once that happens, uh, you can see that this little pocket here, that's what the V-bit needs to do in addition to cutting into the corners, and everything else in the middle is what the 8th inch end mill will take care of. So, advanced V-carve, pick a V-tool and a pocketing tool, and Bob's your uncle. All right, so uh, I think we're doing uh, pretty good on time, and uh, that covers everything else I wanted to talk about today. So I want to thank you guys all very much for joining us. I will stick around in the chats for a couple minutes after the stream ends in case there are any other questions or people just want to shoot the breeze. Um, but thanks for joining us. Stay safe, stay, stay busy, and uh, have fun machining, folks. Take care. Wait, hold on. Last minute question. Does lubricant on the material impact how fast you can cut? Um, so lubricant, cutting fluid, sort of has, has two purposes. One of them is to lubricate the material, so the end mill slices into it more easily. The other is to drop the temperature of that cut. It wicks away heat. Um, so if you're running uh, like a cutting fluid on aluminum, uh, it can actually allow you to cut faster. But if you have an MDF waste board, you're probably not pouring WD-40 all over your cut. Um, and aluminum can be cut perfectly well dry. So uh, consider that. A, take that with a grain of salt. Lubricant might help. It's not always necessary. Um, part of it's for lubrication, part of it's for temperature control. Um, for cutting plastics, a really strong air blast can also help. Um, so uh, play around with it if you think it's necessary, but for the basic uh, cutting parameters that we have in Carbide Create, they shouldn't be necessary. All right, I'll be going now for real. So uh, take care everyone and uh, thanks for dropping in.